Um, welcome everybody to, to Baker's Green Acres. I, things are going to work out the way they're going to work out. Um, I guess like the rest of you, I've been struggling with what's going on in our country and, and what's going on in our state especially. Um, it hasn't really affected me that much, but I, I don't like this. You know, I, I asked before how many of you are oath takers. I'm an oath taker, and uh, I don't like my constitution to be an example, even if it doesn't affect me. I don't like that. And so I spend a lot of time here by myself working and thinking and like, what are we going to do and uh, what can we do? And I wound up going through the Bill of Rights and I started right at the First Amendment and uh, it's pretty obvious that we're not being allowed to assemble. We're being asked to not assemble. We're being asked to stay six feet apart and put a muzzle on your face. I don't know about you guys, but I can't communicate with people if they have a muzzle on. I don't even like to communicate with people. It's like being having a prison wall in between us. I don't like that. I like people, and I like to be able to look at them. And They don't hear well either from a military service, and uh, I need to see someone's mouth. So uh, I believe that some of the things that we need to do in order to restore our freedom is to read our Constitution and then do what they're trying to make us not do, regardless of what they say, because our Constitution is the supreme law of the land. They say you can't congregate. I'm congregating. They say I can't go to church. I'm going to church. They say I can't go to a tavern. I'm going to a tavern. What happens when people congregate? Sometimes people are at a tavern and they have a great idea and they say, let's go throw that stupid tea in the harbor. And what do we have happen? We have things happen, right? So that's why they want to keep us apart. It's like a prison. You want to keep your prisoners separated so they can't Join organize. Forces. Mm -hmm. They can't organize. So I think what we have to do is organize, come together, discuss these things, Second Amendment. We need to be armed up. We need to be. That is our responsibility to be armed up. <clears throat> it's not about, you know, target shooting. <coughs> or deer hunting or anything like that. It's to present a united front that our oppressors, our, our tyrannical uh, uh, elected officials will look at and say, we better not. We better not, because they're getting angry. Because we're a legion. They're just a few. Today we're just a few, but I, the way things dropped in place, um, I, you know, I contacted Catherine Monday after Monday morning, and I got a response the next day in the morning. It actually came in the afternoon, but like being over 50, I don't text much. Um, and I thought, this is one of those things, you know, this is kind of a God thing because you're in high demand right now. And uh, a little bit. you were able to, to come in and meet with us. So I don't want to take up any more time. You're pressed for time. Unfortunately, yes. I really appreciate you coming. If you guys haven't heard her videos that she's putting out, you guys need to study those videos and pass them on. If, you know, we are not all uh, soldiers here, but we all have a specialty. There is something that we can all do. And uh, I think this is almost a call to specialty. I don't want to say call to arms because nowadays that might get you picked up for planning to do something, right? Sure will. <laughs> but I think that was planned because they're they're getting desperate. They are getting desperate. Right. But they get dangerous when they're desperate. So well, let me well, I'd say even more dangerous than that is when you have um, when you have people that are targets because they um, they're in a militia and they own firearms, and they do training exercises, and they like to exercise their rights, and they like to read the Constitution. Uh, they show up to different rallies all across the state to protect people like me from dangers and threats that are out there. Uh, then they're put on a, a watch list, 
Yeah. And then uh, basically, oh, well, then we're going to be able to have this uh, really shady probable cause to be able to get a warrant, which we're not going to show you, by the way, when we show up at a gas station at night and pick you up and your brother and your uh, your wife and take the vehicle so your wife and children can't get home. And then while we're doing that, we'll have another team that's over at your house ransacking it and going through and breaking your doors and confiscating all of your guns. And, uh, oh, you have a 13-year-old daughter at home? Um, yeah, we'll tell you that we won't do anything until you get there, but we're going to make sure that we're uh, having a male officer frisk her and put her in handcuffs and everything before you get there. That's what's happening. So you do have to read... Uh, the Constitution. You have to know your rights because you're not going to see it coming. I mean, they're already trying to do things to us. Sure. Um, so, in fact, um, when House Bill 5672 came out, that was the one they're saying is a good bill to stop employers from f trying to force you to be microchipped as a condition of employment. Our Republicans in the um, in the uh, House of Representatives uh, didn't like that I started doing videos and explaining to people what's in that bill. And so they, they all, whether it's uh, Michelle Hoytenga or Jack O'Malley or quite a few of the other ones that are on Facebook being the advocates for freedom, uh, they were trying to get people to question me and my credentials instead of actually talking about the language of those bills. Because why be responsible for something? Um, so especially when 104 legislators out of 110 voted in favor of it, <clears throat> two voted against it because they thought employers should actually be able to microchip you <laughs> and those are republicans by the way um so it's all around us i mean the the thing with the uh, plot to kidnap the governor i mean that was a violation of fourth amendment um at the very least um and second amendment to have all of their entire firearms confiscated um and uh so i guess you know the wife and the the children don't need a way to protect themselves while dad's hauled all the way up to the other side of the state and locked in a jail, a, a pending, you know, pending any kind of hearings. Hmm. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's getting real, real out there. So um, I guess just so I have a frame of reference, how many of you um, know who I am or what my context of what I've been doing? Okay, most people. Okay. Um, I should probably start... Uh, then at least for the few that didn't raise your hand to tell you a little bit at least. My name's Catherine Henry. Um, the handsome dude that came with me is Mike Henry. Um, and we have kid uh, number two and kid number four that's, uh, I guess, in the car. I don't know. They got out. No, I don't see him. <laughs> so um, so um, we have four kids. Uh, I was born in Michigan. He was born in Texas, you know, so we're real Americans. Um, <laughs> two of the most American states on the, on the planet. Um, and we, um, man, I don't even know what to say. Um, I've been disturbed from day one with what's going on. So I started trying to contact our legislators in the first week of April saying, you better not extend that state of emergency because it's unconstitutional and here's some real practical implications. They didn't listen to me. Um, I built up momentum and people were feeling empowered to know that um, a constitutional attorney was also thinking the same things that they were. So um, luckily on April 30th at the first in-person rally that was held at the Capitol, I spoke that day, but then I also went inside the Capitol and was part of the storming of the Capitol that never happened. Um, in fact, I was front and center. I was standing in between the angriest of the militiamen that were there and the state troopers that were violating our state constitution, Article 4, Section 20, by not letting us in. So um, needless to say, it didn't get violent. There were no uh, threats of physical violence. There were threats of, you know, you're going to be removed from your job or your post because you're not doing what's right, things like that, um, definitely, as, as I think there should be, right? Um, we should all be accountable for our actions. But um, from there on out, there's been three main things, I guess you could say, that I've been trying to work on. Um, one is I wrote the Constitutional Amendment, uh, the Restore Freedom Initiative Petition. Do you know about that? Yes. Okay. Um, and actually, um, do you mind passing that around so people can take a look at it while we're talking? Um, 
it's still going. We're still trying to collect the 425,000 signatures to get it on uh, the 2022 ballot. Uh, we have to get the signatures within a 180-day time frame. We started on May 30th, so 180 days, if we wanted to keep the first few signatures, uh, would be Thanksgiving Day, actually. So, what? What? Just your volume. I don't have it in me to scream anymore. Sorry. Um, I'm exhausted. I have not taken one day off since uh, April 1st in all of this. Not, not one day. Um, I'm calling legislators. I'm on radio shows, TV shows, I'm doing Facebook live videos, I'm drafting briefs for the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals, um, drafting the petition or working on uh, traveling all around the state. I've been all the way up to um, uh, Lorium. Do you know where, anybody know where Lorium is? It is way up there, right? It's past where I was born. I was born in Hancock. So, um, so I've been there, Petoskey, Traverse City. Uh, Port Huron and uh, right downtown Detroit, uh, Grand Rapids. Today I'm going to Walker right after this, and then I got to go to Fowlerville. Um, it's exhausting, um, but there's a reason why I'm willing to work every single day and be exhausted and not have enough volume for apparently people to hear me on our. Are you on Facebook? Is that what you're doing? Is that what you're doing? Yeah. Okay. So, anyway. Um, um, sorry, there's so much going on these days, it's hard to remember everything. Um, so, at any rate, we're trying to get those signatures. Uh, hey, at least the sun's coming out. That yeah. feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, can't go wrong, no. We're trying to get those signatures. We need help from everyone. Um, every single person, even if you're someone who's never been political, you don't know a lot of people, you don't talk to a lot of people, uh, we definitely need help. Uh, Basically, if you see another human without a mask on, you could ask them if they want to sign the petition because they probably enjoy their freedom. So, and the petition, what it does, the summary is, that's the thing I just passed around so people can see that. Um, so aside from that, like I mentioned, I, um, I have not officially been representing any clients yet at the Michigan Court of Appeals or Michigan Supreme Court. I've just re been representing the whole Restore Freedom movement and the... Um, Defending the Constitution of the United States and defending the Michigan Constitution. That's what I, the, the title or purpose under which I'm filing all these briefs uh, with the lawsuits that are there. So I have filed in the legislature's lawsuit against the governor. There's also that one that, that actually got the um, Supreme Court had the hearing on. That was on September 9th. That uh, was four doctor, three doctor's offices and one uh, patient that sued the governor, the attorney general, and the Michigan director of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and so, um, again, I don't represent any of the parties, but I come in, I ask the court to allow me to share my thoughts and, and whatnot on it, and I was actually granted a very rare opportunity on September 9th to be able to argue in front of the Michigan Supreme Court on the unconstitutionality of these executive orders. And um, it's hard to describe all that in five minutes, though, so that's what they gave me. I got, I got, what's that? It was cool to watch. You saw it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um... I was exhausted because that night I stayed up till 5.45 in the morning trying to narrow down what I could say into five minutes. Um, so uh, I was basically sleeping with my eyes open at that point. <laughs> so, um, especially on a Zoom thing, it's a lot harder to stay engaged when it's all on your computer versus in a courtroom, you know. Yeah. So uh, at any rate, um, I'm assuming all of you know about what happened in the Supreme Court on Friday. Yes. Uh, anybody that doesn't know, I guess maybe let, let me ask that. Okay. Um, and then um, I'm assuming you guys also heard that on um, Friday, as soon as the Supreme Court decision came out, what the governor came out saying about that she has at, at least 20 more, one, 21 more days that we have to follow her executive orders. Uh, that's not constitutional. It's not legal. It's not a thing. She's making it up. Very clearly, right from the first go, word go, when that um, opinion was date stamped and published essentially by the clerk of the Supreme Court, uh, it was enforceable right then and there. Because what sense would it make if we um, have something declared unconstitutional for us to follow it when you look at Marbury versus Madison back in the 1800s and they e easily said in that court 
that if you have a law or a government action that's violating the Constitution, it's void on its face. It doesn't do anything. So why would you have to continue following something that's void and has been void from the beginning? You don't. Um, so I think she realized the error of her ways on, um, over the weekend. And so on Monday, that's when she came out with the one-two, the one-two punch on us. Yeah. So she issued... Uh, through the director of the Par Department of Health and Human Services, her subordinate, she issued uh, new orders. She actually issued one on Monday, two or three on Tuesday. I just found out there were another couple of them or so yesterday. Um, and then she also filed, um, and those are of course not under the Emergency Management Act of 1940 or 1976 or the Emergency Powers of Governor Act. Uh, of 1945, the one that was fully declared unconstitutional, those new orders are based on the public health code, which is something I've been trying to warn people about since April, that it's been a problem. And everybody's like, oh no, we're just going to be part of this stand-up Michigan thing, and we're going to repeal 1945, and everything's going to be better, and we're going to wake up, it's like Christmas morning, there's not going to be any executive orders. And I've been telling people from the get-go, that's not how it's going to happen. And lo and behold, our court officially struck down uh, that 1945 law, and guess what? She's still trying uh, to do things under other laws. So um, I, I would love to have been wrong about that, let me tell you. Um, I mean, it doesn't happen very often in our house, right, honey, that I'm wrong? <laughs> um, but I would have loved to have been wrong about that. But um, nope, unfortunately, I saw it coming. That's why those things are in that constitutional amendment petition. Um, anyway, so the... She has the new orders um, for, from Department of Health and Human Services, and then they do, in large part, what the other orders were doing. In fact, she's done press conferences saying that. Um, and then we have um, a motion that the governor then filed on Monday with the Supreme Court saying, well, so I think you should give me 28 days after the, the ruling came out, so on the 30th of October. And... <sighs> I'm just going to say I'm disgusted because there's no sound basis in law uh, to be able to even argue for such a thing, uh, and yet that's what they're doing. So um, I finally finished my response to that on yesterday, Friday, and um, filed it with the Supreme Court. So essentially what it boils down to is we have elected representatives, or even the appointed guy, right, uh, Robert um, Gordon, the d director of the Department of Health and Human Services. He's not elected, he's appointed. All government officials or government employees in the state of Michigan have to take an oath of office. Our U.S. Constitution, Article 6, says that you're, if you're in any of the three branches of government, you have to take an oath to uphold the U.S. Constitution. Our state constitution, Article 11, Section 1, says that if you are... Um, uh, a state, uh, essentially a state elected official or appointed official, you have to take an oath that to uphold the U.S. and Michigan constitutions and no other oath. Not an oath to uphold the laws or the charter of any particular state uh, or city or anything like that uh, because oftentimes we have laws that are passed that are not constitutional. So why put you in that bind? Your oath is to the Constitution. Uh, then we have something in our laws uh, MCL 15.151, which says if you even work for, if you are even employed by, um, man, I did not see that there would be sun out, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I left all of it. We have 42 pairs of sunglasses, and they're all over there because I was like, it's so cold. The sun's not coming out. Um, but uh, 15.151 says that if you're employed at all, you could be at a school and just be a crossing guard. You could be the lunch lady. You could be the principal. You could be on, uh, on a school board. If you have a job in government, then you have to take the same oath of office in order to hold that employment. So um, at any rate, it, whether it's the director of the Department of Health and Human Services or anybody else, you know, like Oakland County, for example, I think was the first county that came out with their flashy new order. Uh, to stop everybody in, in Oakland County from exercising their freedoms. Um, all of those officials are neglecting their oath. They're violating their oath when they violate our Constitution. And we need to band together to tell them. We need to spread the word. 
uh, to everyone to contact these officials, whether you live in those areas or not. Contact state reps and senators, yours and others in the state. Contact uh, the governor's office and the director of the Department of Health and Human Services. But keep in mind, these are the very people that she keeps saying, you know, it's the Republicans that are causing the problems and are being so political about things. And yet in every single one of her speeches, she keeps talking about how the Republicans are the problem and the Republicans need to get to work and the Republicans need to take this seriously. In fact, uh, this director of the Department of Health and Human Services made a press release the day he issued his new order and he, oh, you're a lifesaver. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now I don't look like I'm trying to hide from you guys. <sighs> okay, that's better. Do we look better? You look so much more cheery now. <laughs> there, there's a yellow lens that just brightens everything up here. So um, he actually wrote um, something how, you know, we have to do this. The governor's orders were declared unconstitutional. So we have to issue these um, uh, emergency orders are done under his the statutes he's using are they call them emergency orders we have to do this because the court screwed up the court invalidated a 75 year old law on this silly thing called the non-delegation doctrine nobody's hardly ever used it hasn't been used in um, in 85 years in the United States, uh, you know, federal courts it hasn't been used ever in the state of Michigan to invalidate a law. And he literally said the anti-government right is just, uh, it's, it's getting popular with the anti-government right. And so this four to three court invalidated this perfectly good 75 year old law. What he's forgetting is, number one, he took an oath of office to uphold the U.S. and Michigan constitutions. And number two, and, and quite frankly, this one is the one that's kind of upsetting me, is even the most conservative judges on our court, on the Supreme Court, even though they ruled against the 1945 Act, because it is unconstitutional, um, they went through this whole analysis about, well, you know, it, it has... Um, We'll talk about this non-delegation doctrine, and they can't, they can give her some powers, but they can't give her too many, or they can't, it can't be for too long, or we have to have oversight. Uh, what they're forgetting is, they were addressing the questions tied directly to the Michigan Constitution, and although the U.S. Constitution doesn't have a separation of powers clause or a non-delegation clause, I mean, they're just common sense in Article 1, Article 2, and Article 3 uh, that dole out powers to the different branches. But the Michigan Constitution in Article 4, Section 1, Article 5, Section 1, and Article 6, Section 1, that gives uh, each branch of government their own powers. But we back it up a little bit. Article 3, Section 2 has literally a separation of powers clause and a non-delegation clause, meaning uh, in the United States um, uh, Constitution, it's a doctrine. It's not something that's spelled out and made obvious. The Michigan Constitution, it's, just, it's not just a doctrine or a philosophy that we're supposed to follow. It's actual words written in there. It literally says, our, uh, we have a separation of powers, our, our powers of government are divided into the three branches, and then it has a second sentence that says, no one person exercising the powers of one branch shall exercise the powers of another branch. I don't see how they can apply some sort of test to make it okay to that. It literally says, no person can do this. Why do you think you can make up all extra rules and, and carve-outs and exceptions to make it okay? Not a single person in the executive branch should ever be exercising rulemaking or lawmaking authority over anyone in the state of Michigan, period. Even if you think the United States Constitution allows for some of those situations, our Constitution in the state of Michigan is exceedingly clear. And they, do, they didn't even quote the words. They're not even talking about the words of the Constitution in the state of Michigan. They're just talking about all the cases that are happening at the United States level, in the United States Supreme Court. So under it all, we need to remember that every single person, whether you serve in the military or when, whether you're uh, on the local school board, even a, just, you know, a teacher or a police officer or, you know, um, in the public library, you're, you're an employee in, in the public library, Every single one of us who has worked or volunteered to be in any kind of government capacity took an oath of office in order to do that. Uh, and if you didn't, you don't have a right to be in that position. So we need to hold all those people accountable. It doesn't matter how small the office or how big the office. 
And we all need to remember, we didn't get our rights from the court. The Michigan Supreme Court did not give me any of my freedom. The United States Supreme Court didn't give me any of my freedom. Governor Whitmer, uh, President Trump, uh, the Attorney General Dana Nessel, um, the, the legislature, none of them gave me my freedom. God gave me my freedom, and he gave you your freedom. And the government can't just take it away. And, you know, for those people that say, oh, no, 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 we have separation of church and states written right in our Constitution, those words don't even exist in our Constitution, and for a reason. It literally says in our preamble, one of the very reasons we created our entire country's government was to secure the blessings of freedom. In our state constitution, it is the only reason why we created a state government. We, the people of the state of Michigan, grateful to Almighty God for the blessings of freedom and earnestly desiring to secure those blessings for ourselves and our posterity undiminished, do hereby ordain and establish this constitution. That's it. That's the whole preamble. I don't know how much clearer it can be. The rights are given to us by God, and they are to be exercised undiminished. That means they can't just, oh, it's a time of emergency. Oh, there's a plague. There's a pandemic. There's war. There's something going on. You can't exercise your right. You better not meet with people. You better not try to talk to your elected representatives. You better not try to go to church. Because now, here's one of those exceptions when things are scary, and you need the government to take care of you. Because you don't have your own parents. We have to take care of you and tell you what to do, because that's what the United States is all about. That's what they're trying to say. Don't ever let any government official or agency ever tell that to you, because it's not right. And they're derelict in their duty, and they're violating the Constitution. In fact, they're violating federal law. Among other things, 18 U.S.C. Section 241 says if you have two or more people that are conspiring to deny people of their constitutionally protected freedoms, it's a federal crime. It's a felony. Uh, punishable by up to 10 years in prison, and if people die because of that, then that's punishable up to death. It's about time we start taking this seriously. So whether it's just, um, you know, something you saw in the news that people were trying to kidnap the governor, which is not what was happening, literally people were trying to figure out how to get her arrested for the crime she is committing. Um, whether it's, you know, the... Um, the commission, uh, and I forget what they're called, but the capital commission that makes the rules for being able to be at the state capitol and how they were entertaining the idea of banning firearms uh, after all the violent protests that the freedom lovers and Second Amendment advocates have been engaged in this year. Um, whether it's uh, later today, my next event, you guys should follow me down <laughs> to the Grand Rapids area, is about medical freedom. Um, I believe they're, we're going to be hearing things from people that are advocating against the forced use of masks or inappropriate use of masks, um, the, uh, against the forced use of microchipping or of contact tracing or all these things that they're trying to do right now. Um, so, you know, whether it's any of those things, we need to stick together. We need to help educate each other. We need to encourage each other, and we need to make sure that we know our constitutional freedoms, and we don't ever let anybody try to take those away from us. Our state constitution is unique in a lot of ways. One way is, if you look at, who, who here has ever read our state constitution? Three, four, three and a half, four, maybe? Okay. Um, anybody, don't cheat now. Don't, don't open it if, if you have one with you. What is the first um, Article 1? What is Article 1 all about? Any takers? Declaration of Rights. It was not amendments added at the end. It's the very first thing in our state constitution. 27 sections that are declaring our rights. What's even better than that, though, my favorite clause of the whole thing, Article 1, Section 23. Article 1, Section 23 has almost identical language to the Ninth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Does anybody know what the Ninth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is? It's the one that says, basically, God gave us all our freedoms. We have so many freedoms, we couldn't possibly write them all down. But guess what? We have unenumerated freedoms that the government still can, not only cannot trample upon, the government still has to provide the same protections and privileges for those freedoms as all the other ones that we've enumerated. So what does that mean? Do we need to wait for a court to hand out a decision that says, you have the right to not have to wear a mask when you're in public? No, we don't have to have them write it down that we have the right to breathe fresh air because if we needed to wait for them to write it down, then we would have enumerated it from the beginning. We intentionally left all of our rights that aren't in there 
unenumerated, but they're still covered. We still have them. God still gave them to us. So if somebody ever says to you, well, and I've had hundreds of people since April ask me, what's the law that says I don't have to wear a mask? What's the law that says that I don't have to be, you know, they can't contact trace me or micro trip chip me or, you know, that I can be at this place or that, or whatever. The biggest uh, concept, if I, if I can give you a takeaway at all, is it's twofold. One, all of our freedoms are given to us by, any takers? God. Oh, man, I know this isn't a huge crowd, but you guys can do so much better than that. God. That's a little better, but... Okay, in seven minutes, you guys are going to be ready to really say it. God gave us our freedom. Um, and we, the people, still hold ultimate power. Article 4, Section 4 of our, of our U.S. Constitution guarantees us a Republican form of government. That means we, the people, retain power, and we simply loan out certain amounts of that power to elected officials to represent us. So we retain that power. We don't get our permissions from the government to act. We don't need to prove the existence of a freedom in order to exercise it. The burden of proof is not on us. However, on the flip side, the government does not exist but for us creating that compact with each other to come together as a collective society and have rules in place. Literally, the Constitution, whether it's the U.S. Constitution or the state Constitution, the whole purpose is to secure our blessings of liberty. So to the extent that the government... Um. Anyway, um, so we need to remember all these things, you know, people are saying, well, this statute says this, this law says that the director of the Department of Health and Human Services can issue these orders that deny us the right to um, gather. Well, yeah, MCL 333.2253 does give him the right to do that. Uh, likewise, 333.2453 gives our local health departments the same right to prohibit gatherings for any purpose, the law says. Well, who gives a crap what the law says if it blatantly violates the Constitution? I mean, our First Amendment rights in the United States Constitution, our Article 1, Section 3, and Article 1, Section 4 rights in our state Constitution, we have the right to peaceably assemble, period. Undiminished, unabridged. They can't change that. So we don't have to even say, well, it's for, a, a, you know, we can go to church services and only like at times that would normally be, normal, you know, acceptable religious. No. If, if we have, if part of our religion and our freedom of religion is being able to communicate and have um, um, fellowship and discussion and not wear masks and to be seen and out um, and expressing, you know, ourselves with each other. If God wants us to be a community, well, then we need to be a community. It's not a community when we're told we can't gather and we're told we have to mask up and that we don't have any choices in that. So um, we don't have to just be in a church building to exercise our right to freedom of religion. That's not how it works. And if they think that's how it works, they need to show me in the Constitution where it says that because we don't have, uh, judges don't make laws and they didn't make the Constitution. We, the people, made the Constitution. So hopefully the two main things I'm able to leave you with today is that no government gave you your, your freedoms. They can't just take it away. And the government cannot act unless we specifically have given them the authority in our state or federal constitution to do so. If we have not, if they can't show where they have the right to do something, then they don't have it. And I don't care what court said what. I don't care what the case law says, because last I checked, uh, the legislative authority in our country was given to Congress, and the legislative authority in our state was given to our legislature, and on county levels, it's the Board of Commissioners or whatever. So no judge can ever tell me that they are able to make the laws and describe for us ways that our freedoms are limited in ways that our Constitution does not allow them to be limited. So with that being said, I guess I should probably ask if you have any questions because I realize my time's already well over here. Holy well, cow. We have plenty of another hour easy. Yeah, we have. <laughs> we guys can follow me down to uh, Walker. <laughs> but um, we need solutions. Like uh, when you started off by telling us about how they had picked these guys up and separated families, confiscated their stuff. 
And what that does is that puts fear in everybody when you hear that because you think should. they're going to do that to me. They are. And so that's why they did it because fear is an emotion that once we're fearful, we're easily manipulated. Well, I'll take my flag down because I don't want to be the next guy picked up. Oh, but Second but, Timothy says that we're, we're, God did not give us a spirit of fear. He gave us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. So what we need to do is take that, uh, that thing that should make us afraid and instead wake us up enough to realize we do need to take the action steps. So number one, long term, we need to sign this petition. We need to get it on the ballot for 2022 because although no one wants to wait till 2022, uh, no one that's complained to me about that taking too long has ever had any alternative as to how this is going to get done quicker. Okay. So the other thing we need to do is, like I said, educate yourselves, educate your family, your friends, the people at the grocery store and the gas station and the, the library on your kids' sports teams, if they're even playing sports. Um, you need to educate everyone you can. Hand out copies of the Constitution if you have them. Now, our state Constitution, you have to be careful because the most recent version is actually, um, I think they came out with that January 2019 because we had some amendments to our state Constitution that were passed in November 2018. Uh, and unlike our U.S. Constitution where the amendments get added at the back, our state constitution, the amendments that have passed so far are actually just integrations or changes into the remainder of the constitution. So, um, but you can find the um, most recent version of our state constitution and our United States constitution right on my website, restorefreedomkh.com. Share those links with people. Um, help spread the word. Um, <laughs> You know, share, read the briefs that I've been putting on there that I've been filing with the Supreme Court. Read all the ridiculousness that all these other attorneys that have been arguing for why, you know, we should extend these executive orders and things like that. I put those, the most recent set of briefs, on um, our website as well. Um, make sure you, you study the whole Constitution, Article, or, or State Constitution, Federal Constitution. Make sure you really study those. But if you need somewhere to start for now... No Article 1 of our state constitution front and back. Before next week, make sure that you could come up with all of those on the top of your head. That means you guys especially. Are you teenagers? Are you a teenager? Okay, well, I have three teenagers. And the biggest impact that you can make in your own life is knowing and learning. Now, I don't know you guys, but I know that 99.9% .9 of all teenagers already think they do know everything. Mm. Right, parents? Yeah. Uh, but as long as you know your constitutionally protected, God-given freedoms, then you'll be leaps and bounds ahead of every other adult, basically, that's on our planet right now. So make sure that if you're only going to really study one thing right now, it's Article 1 of our state constitution. And I would say the first through the 14... Uh, the first 14 amendments of our United States Constitution, if you're only going to study one little chunk of our United States Constitution, study that. Well, and Article 6. That's super important. Um, Article 6 has the Supremacy Clause. Article 6 has the Oath of Office. Article 6 has one more great thing that I can't remember off the top of my head. But um, So make sure that you are weaponizing yourself with those pieces, with, with that knowledge. And quite frankly, if you've... Um, you know, if you've been thinking about um, purchasing another firearm or, you know, whether you should stock up on ammunition or whether you need whatever, go ahead and do it because things might get ugly real quick here. And although I would much rather change things through, you know, things like this constitutional amendment and fighting the cases in court and doing all that, be prepared because this is, this is, we're seeing things uh, like, None other. I mean, this is back in, in the days where we created our country in the first place, the things that are happening so egregiously to us. So we need to be prepared and we need to also in general, but we also need to be prepared that we might lose uh, friends over this. We might lose business acquaintances or, you know, things like that because people don't like to hear a lot of what's being said, right? People don't like to hear the truth. They don't like to hear that... Um, most of our government is actually not doing their job. So if we had anybody that on May 1st, um, whether it's my own state rep, whether it's the Speaker of the House or the, or the Senate Majority Leader, if any of them had stood on the steps of the Capitol where I had stood just the day before, and they had said, you know what? There's no more executive orders. You're free. 
They're not, they're not legal anymore. Go about your business. That's all that it would have taken for the people of Michigan to realize that they don't have to wait for a court to, to sort it out. But instead, what did they do? Well, the Senate Majority Leader and the uh, Speaker of the House sent out tweets and did press conferences and all that saying, well, we voted to sue them. We're going to be your saviors. We're going to fix this. And you just need to wait for the courts to sort it all out. No. No, they, no we don't. We don't. So at any rate, are there any um, super urgent questions? Because my mouth has already gotten me. 20 minutes late to... <laughs> I would just like to thank you for what you've done. I've been following you since April. Oh. And it's just, it's just, I'm glad somebody's standing up. Well, I'm sitting right now, well, but... you know what I mean. So what was the basis for this Mr. Gordon to uh, go ahead and follow through with the governor's no orders? He's using the public health code. His specific statute is 333.2253. But it does not allow for the masks. It does not allow for any of the closing of businesses. The only three things that that allows, the only th same three things that the, the sister version, the 333.2453 uh, that allows the local health departments to make these orders, yeah. the only things uh, that they are allowed to do are threefold. One, to prohibit the gathering of people for any purpose, which is blatantly unconstitutional, so we won't even go there. The second thing is that they can ensure the continuity or continuation of essential public health services. Providing masks to those who are vulnerable uh, or immunocompromised or elderly, uh, that would be a public health service. Providing educational topics, uh, webinars or whatnot to people to understand how to, you know, some of the best practices for reducing the spread of COVID-19, that would be as an essential public health service. Providing mental health care treatment uh, and screening in, in increased amounts, given all the stress that our state and our country are under, that would be an essential public health service, making sure routine care, dental and physical routine care, spiritual, you know, routine care is, is allowed and is uh, followed through upon. Uh, those would be essential public health services, requiring people to wear a mask, requiring people to be, you know, at half capacity in their restaurant, or if you're in a movie theater, you don't get to open till like October 9th. That's not an essential public health service and by no stretch of the imagination. Really meet a pandemic type things. So it's not classified really as a pandemic. Even if it is, even if it's the bu bubonic plague, the law does not allow them to do any of that they're doing with the masks and the social distancing and the contact tracing. The Constitution doesn't either, but the law doesn't. The third and final thing that they're allowed to do is enforce health laws that are already on the books. So somebody show me where it already says in our laws that we have to wear masks, yeah, it's not that we have to be socially distant. The only thing I'm aware of, and I, I, I'm really hoping I'm wrong, is that some Republicans, uh, unfortunately, drafted a law that was basically geared towards the reopening of schools uh, and purported to allow the local school districts to make the decisions, but then directed them that they had to base their decisions upon certain things, including that there had to be uh, elements of contact tracing and social distancing and wearing masks and other elements that the CDC has been pushing. So um, my understanding last I saw that one is that governor did sign that bill. I just don't remember what the number is off the top of my head. But I want to say it was a bill originally sponsored by Julie Calley of the 87th district. So basically, they're just pushing forward more unconstitutional bills, basically. Yes. So and whatever, um, I guess. One last, yeah, honestly, I haven't seen one bad bill this whole time come out from a Democrat. Now, I'm not saying they're not there. I have not seen one bad bill. The bills that are being pushed and, and touted as these wonderful bills have been awful. Uh, we have bills that are you know, aimed at uh, preventing microchipping, you know, preventing an employer from requiring you to be microchipped, but the bill says a court can do it. As long as the court requires you to be microchipped like an animal, yeah, that's totally okay. I mean, Jack O'Malley thinks it's totally fine to have people microchips if they're, say, a criminal. And it's, it's the next generation of tethering, he said. Well, I'm so glad that we no longer value the sanctity of the human body and an individual's right to have autonomy over their own body, regardless of whether they've been convicted of a crime or not. But um, Section 4 of that bill specifically says that you're limited to actual damages, 
What that means is even if an employer is going to violate your rights and try to require you to be microchipped as a condition of your employment, uh, when you bring them to court and sue them, all you're allowed to do is bring your receipts and prove every single penny that they have cost you by requiring that. And if you're not actually out any money, or maybe you're out 20 bucks because of you know whatever, uh, you get your court filing fee, you get your attorney's fees, and then you get whatever you prove is out of pocket. What employer, especially what big employer like Consumers Energy or Ford or one of the, the hospital health systems, what are they gonna care if they have a few lawsuits here and there that are all about actual damages? The attorneys are gonna get rich off that. Well, they don't need to get rich off that. I'm not getting rich off the work I'm doing. Everything I've been doing is on donation. So uh, what we need to see in there is punitive damages and statutory damages. Statutory damages is where the legislature says ahead of time, hey, you, you employers, if you're going to even attempt to do this, we set out ahead of time, you're going to have to pay $10,000. As soon as they prove that you've done it, you pay $10,000 or whatever the amount is that the legislature sets in the law. Punitive damages are even bigger, greater, you know, scarier things meant to penalize or ward off anybody even thinking about doing it. Oh, you want to violate the rights of others? Guess what? We're going to stop you from doing that from the beginning because if you do that, we're going to allow huge awards to be made in the millions against your organization. That's going to stop people. There's a couple other issues with some vaccine uh, bills with, um, what was the, the mask bill. Um, I want to say it's House Bill 6134 that says you can, um, it's being touted as the, the bill that's going to save us from mask requirements. The way it's currently worded, though, is that these mask requirements, as long as a community, um, I want to say it might even cover private organizations, but definitely the lo local uh, governments and whatnot, as long as they get their mask requirement, their ordinance or whatever, in, uh, by the time the law is put into effect, they're good. It's totally fine for them to require masks. So what does this mean? Well, when it hits the legislature, or which, when it hits the governor's desk and it's been passed by the House and the Senate, uh, she could simply wait to sign it and call up all the local counties and say, hey, I see you haven't uh, you know, passed one of these yet. You need to get on that because as long as you get that in by the date this law goes into effect, then you're good. And then she could be touted as the, you know, bipartisan hero that's working with the legislature on this. Uh, I don't care when it goes into effect. Anything that's unconstitutional is unconstitutional, period. And no organization should have the right to require us to wear masks at all. And that's what that bill should be reflected to say. Um, so anyway, yeah, we need to be mindful of those things. Don't just read a summary. Don't even listen to what the news is telling you. Don't listen to what other people that you trust are telling you. Read the bills yourselves. In fact, the, the three bills that are on the top of my head are short enough that I want to say some of them are two pages and one of them's three pages, and that's double-spaced. And that's with the big heading at the top. <laughs> the bills are not on my website. Those are on the legislature's website. Okay. Yep, so you just legislature.gov, I believe, or no. Michigan's got to be in there somewhere. If you Google Michigan legislature, it'll take you to the right place. Yeah. Any? Are those all House sponsored or House and Senate? Uh, I'm sure there's some in the Senate. I just haven't seen, um, as far as I can think of, really Senate Bill 858 was the last that came across my radar. Do you ever have the opportunity to argue against those bills? You come up to the legislature? Have I? Yeah. Um, I haven't known about when they're um, having a hearing okay. on those. I'd love the opportunity to do that. I'd like you to do Michigan Township Association is keeping a pretty good eye on a lot of these bills. So, and so does MCSSA, Michigan County Social Services. They have a legislative committee that follow a lot of these bills. Okay. They kind of lean with the government, but unfortunately. They do. Yeah, we definitely, does, definitely yeah. like constitutional input to any kind of bill like that. You know, it kind of restricts our our freedom. You know? So I've already I've already been here an hour, and yeah. I I'm way past when I'm supposed to go. If you guys have any additional questions, though, I'm just trying to think of the best way. I have gotten probably two thousand text messages this week, yeah. um, and I've gotten at least as many emails. So. Um, I would say if you guys have any questions, 
um, try to maybe communicate all together because there's a good chance I already have a video out there about it or I have a post or something that has information already out there. And if not, then the next time I do a video, we're going to try to get more and more onto our YouTube channel directly instead of just on the Facebook channel uh, with Facebook shutting down and closing a lot of accounts from people. So um, anyway, that's probably going to be the best way to have additional questions okay. uh, answered. Um, normally I'd say just contact me, but it might be two, three weeks before I can sure. even read the message. <laughs> You're lucky I saw the one I did. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, And if you guys are willing to help us circulate the petition, please do so. You can go to the RestoreFreedomKH.com website. Uh, petition is a whole tab on there. It gives you how to sign up, gives, where to get the petitions, everything else like that. If you are willing to help donate, even if it's $5 towards the cause, uh, there's three separate ways to donate listed right on that website as well. Uh, resources tab, that's where all those briefs are, the links to the Michigan and U.S. constitutions, um, all the other things that we've kind of talked about today. So basically, my, the website is the one-stop shop because I know that's the one platform that uh, Zuckerberg and the others can't take away. So um, that's, that's going to be the best source of things for that. So I'm going to... This, this is great. we got to get you on your way. It's just that we know that things are changing quickly, daily. Things change. And so we'll just have to remain rigid, rigidly flexible in what we do. But thanks for the information, and we're behind you. Yeah, and we started talking about freedom and getting passionate about our rights. Yeah. And look, sun's out. It's warm now. Yeah. So. <laughs>